In single-place predicate logic, we learned how to integrate quantifiers, subjects, and predicates into our symbolization scheme. This lets us symbolize sentences where there's relationships between groups and properties or subjects and predicates. But what we're lacking is the ability to actually talk about the relationship between multiple subjects. So I couldn't say things like A likes B or the Blue Jays are better than the Rangers and stuff like that. That's what we're going to focus on in today's video. We'll be symbolizing multiple place predicates which will let us talk about the relationships between several different subjects. So predicates we are already familiar with, like F, A is fast. Now notice this predicate has the superscript 1, and that indicates that it is only one place. Here we have L2 and A2, and these are two place predicates, so two different subjects go into them, and the way and order they go into them is determined by the abbreviation scheme. Three place predicates are no problem, we deal with them all the time, so here's an example, B3, A borrows B from C, and so on. Again, we can use the italicize A or the italicize Bs for our places where the subjects go in, or we can use the sets with the number one or the number two and so on in them as well. Now there's no actual limit to the number of places that a predicate can have, uh, so we can go all the way up to n place predicates, but for our purposes, typically we'll stay at three and under because that's enough to learn how to symbolize, and if you ever see or encounter higher place predicates in the future, you won't have any problems. Before we begin, we should point out the syntactical differences between multiplace and single place predicate. In single place predicates, we would always have the predicate followed by the subject, and we would never use brackets. In multiplace predicates, we always use brackets to contain the subjects or the places together. So we will never see something like f bracket x bracket, because that's single place, and we will see things that look like a bracket xy close bracket. The other important difference in multiplace predicates is that the actual order within the predicate of the subjects themselves matter. So here LAB doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as LBA. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. So we can never assume that uh, we can just flip the order of the entries around. And we'll see how that works a lot in the examples to come. So here's a very basic example of what a multiplace predicate looks like. Someone likes Barb, Barb likes someone, how do I symbolize these? Well, let's look at the first one. For someone likes Barb, the first thing I have to say is that there is someone and that person likes Barb. Well, since Barb is just a name letter A, the symbolization of this is pretty straightforward. We say there exists X, FX, and LXA. What about Barb likes someone? Well, we actually have to say the same thing. We have to say there is someone and Barb likes that person. So the difference here is that the, in the L predicate, instead of it saying XA, it says AX. And this is an example where order matters and the order actually dictates the true meaning of the sentence. How do I deal with negations? Well here the negations of quantifiers and negation of properties is no different than how we did it in single place. Not everyone likes Barb can be paraphrased in one of two ways. It can be paraphrased as saying uh, there is someone who doesn't like Barb, uh, or we can say it's not the case that for everyone you like Barb. And what about Barb doesn't like everyone or anyone? It's pretty much the exact same. So our basic sentential, sorry, single place predicate skills uh, fit nicely with multi-place predicate. Now things do become a little bit more complicated when we move away from names. Names, if you remember, are very nice to symbolize because we never actually have to use a quantifier to introduce the name. But what if I want to symbolize something that says everyone loves someone? Now here it's clear that I'm not using names and I need to invoke new uh, quantifiers for everyone and for someone. Now in the past it didn't really matter how we were doing things, we could use the same letters and so on, uh, but moving forward we have to be a bit more careful because we see here when the quantifiers are nested, that is to say one quantifier falls under the scope of the other, we do have to be quite careful about what letters we use because here if I use x for everything that in the end I have LXX and it's unclear if it's the everyone who loves someone or the someone who's loving everyone. So the proper way to do this and the way I'm always going to suggest moving forward is that whenever you have nested quantifiers it's always safest and best to introduce your second quantifier and your third quantifier with a new letter that way there never be any risk of confusion. So here, everyone loves someone. I start by introducing everyone for all x, f, x, and I invoke the canonical form of everyone, sorry, the of universal to get the conditional. Then I have the existential y, f, y for someone, and l, x, y. 
every person X loves some person Y. Now you might actually notice that what I said was somewhat ambiguous. Everyone loves someone can be interpreted in one of two different ways. The first way I could interpret it is to say that every person loves some random or generic person, Y. So that would be the saying like, oh, well, everyone must love their mother. Uh, and so there, notice that everyone has a different mother, but that's okay, it's still captured by the meaning everyone loves someone. The other way we can understand everyone loves someone is to say that there is some particular person, some specific person that everyone loves, like Santa Claus. And in this case, it actually has a very different meaning. So how can we capture the different meanings of an ambiguous sentence like this? Uh, well, it turns out that it's actually the order, the quantifiers, that will dictate the true meaning. The original way that I symbolize this is to say that for each person, they love some generic person. And the way that we can see this clearly is because we introduce each person or every person first and say that each individual person then has someone that they love. That person, that someone, doesn't have to be the same. But in the second symbolization I have here at the bottom, what I do is I first introduce an individual person. I say there is someone, at least one person actually, uh, and for all people, X loves Y. So this is actually pinning down the individual first. So this second interpretation says everyone loves some specific person. Now, the order of the quantifiers here really does dictate it, and it's a relationship between the universal and the existential. If you have a string of universals in a row, or a string of existentials in a row, that's never going to be ambiguous or have to worry about specifying between a particular specific versus a generic. The trick is, when you have a universal and an existential, the order will dictate whether or not the existential is picking out a generic person or a specific person for the reasons we just talked about. So if you ever have the situation, if the universal comes first, followed by the existential, that means that that existential is a generic thing. It doesn't have to be the same. But if you actually specify the existential first and then say something about the universal, suddenly we've changed it so that we've pinned down the existential to be a specific thing. And this is how we disambiguate complicated sentences in multiplace predicate logic. So some general tips then that we've learned. Remember to use multiplace predicates with brackets and also remember that order matters. Typically, we will always invoke new variables for nested quantifiers, and order the quantifier really matters, and it will disambiguate sentences for us. We're now able to sort of symbolize some more complicated statements, uh, and we'll sort of build up slowly over the rest of this video and video part two, our sort of stock of symbolizations that we can do. So let's look at a very simple one, some dogs chase cats. Now to approach a question like this, it's very nice and easy, we use the same skills. We ask, okay, well, am I talking about all dogs or some dogs? What I'm asking is, if I want to introduce dogs, do I use a universal or an existential? And it's pretty clear that I'm using the existential, so I just go ahead and symbolize and I use the canonical form of the existential with the and. Now for cats, I ask the same thing, is it all cats or some cats? Again, I just have to sort of think about it, and it's pretty clear that some dog chases cats. Uh, is not about chasing all cats, it's about chasing some cats. So now I'm ready to introduce another quantifier and another sort of uh, canonical form. And here, notice, I've used a brand new letter Y. Now that I've introduced what the dogs are, X, and what the cats are, Y, I'm finally ready to say the chase relation, which is just C, X, Y. Now, you can actually symbolize this in a variety of ways. I clearly didn't need to introduce the dog first. I could have introduced the cat first. Uh, the interesting one is the last one, where what I've done is I've actually pulled all the quantifiers out so that the quantifiers have scope over everything in the sentence. I never symbolize this way, and typically I suggest for students not to symbolize this way either. I will go over what this form is and what it sort of uh, can do for you in the third symbolization video of predicate logic, multiplace. But for now, I'm just going to sort of mention it and sort of suggest not to bother symbolizing it that way. Here are some incorrect symbolizations of some dogs chase cat, which come up often. The first one, the problem is, 
I have and CXY at the end, but X and Y are not under the scope of any particular quantifier. So that means X and Y are free variables. And remember, free variables have no meaning when we symbolize, and so this just isn't a good symbolic sentence for symbolization. In the second example, uh, I actually do have CXY under the scope of there exists an X, but notice that the Y is free. It's not under the scope of a quantifier for Y, so it's also no good. The last example would just come from someone who doesn't really understand how the predicates work, but only subjects, only individual terms can go into a predicate. So here, I've tried to put in a predicate within a predicate, and that just doesn't make sense. And if you just try and insert using the symbolization scheme, you'll see uh, how this doesn't work. So a couple other sort of important things to add on to our sort of uh, list of tips here is that remember that paraphrasing and the canonical form are still really important for multiplace. And the other thing, which we're going to focus on in the subsequent examples, is that we always want to introduce everything uh, first before we say the big complicated relation, and we need to be careful of the scope. So let's take a look at a more complicated example. No one watches every summer blockbuster movie. Now, I'm not going to symbolize this directly. What I mean is I'm not just going to symbolize this left to right. What I'm going to demonstrate in this example is how to use sort of a technique where we work backwards from the main predicate. Now, what's the main predicate? You can think of it as actually the main thing that we're really trying to say in the sentence, the main sort of important relation. And here, it's actually the relation of watching. We're really trying to convey some information about someone watching something else. So when we look at the main predicate, it's going to be D, A watches B. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to specify arbitrarily that the letters that I want to appear in D are going to be X and Y. Because it really doesn't matter. The choice of variable letter is totally random, so you can pick whatever you want. So I'm going to say D will look like X, Y. Now I just need to ask the question, what is X and what is Y? Well according to the sentence, X is the person who's watching, so that's no one and Y is the thing that's being watched, which is every summer blockbuster movie. So now I have some sort of idea of what X and Y are supposed to be. So from here, I can actually symbolize uh, independently no one and every summer blockbuster movie. And I get the following rough symbolizations. Now no one actually has a variety of different forms, but we're not worried about it for now. We're just gonna say it's not the case that there is a person, that's no one. And how do I introduce Summer Blockbuster Movie? Well, Summer Blockbuster Movie is just a sort of a collection of complex um, subject terms. So here it's for all Y, GY, and BY, and DY. How did I know to use Y? Well, it's because of my arbitrary choice. Now I'm actually ready to put this all together using the canonical form of my quantifiers. And I get the following. It's not the case that there is someone, and for all Summer Blockbuster Movies, then that person watches all summer blockbuster movies. Now notice what we did here was we introduced every single subject or term first before we said the final predicate. And that is a very handy and helpful trick in symbolizing and it's definitely what you should do moving forward. Now there are other ways to symbolize uh, no one watches every summer blockbuster movie and it depends on how you would paraphrase a sentence. You might paraphrase it saying if you're a person, then it's not the case that you watch every summer blockbuster movie. And then you would get a symbolization like this, where you move the negation inside. And this is actually just a variant on quantifier negation that we've seen in the past. And you could even move that quantifier negation one more and say, if you're a person, then there is a summer blockbuster movie that you do not watch. And what would that look like? Well, it looks like this. Again, though, based off of your paraphrase, you would symbolize it differently, but still remember you want to try and capture the ultimate final predicate, which in this case is dxy. This skill of working from the main predicate outwards is also very important and helpful for translation. Now translation isn't just important for the translation questions that you might see on a test. A translation lets you be good at symbolizing itself, because after you symbolize something, you can use your translation skills to test and actually see if you get it right. So, what do I do when I look at a sentence like this? For all x, fx, and gx, arrow, there exists a y, hy, and a y, x. Well, I'm going to actually focus on the a. It's the actual big predicate. y stands in the a relation to x. And this is actually going to be the important way that I can translate this sentence. 
So what's x and what's y? Well, I just sort of need to look a little closer and figure it out. My x's are all f's and g's, and I can see that because it's a universal fx and gx arrow. So now I know it's all f's and g's. My y's are going to be that there exists a y, h, y. So that's some generic h. Now notice I said generic because here I have a mixture of universal and existential quantifiers, but the existential comes second. So I know that it's a generic h. Well now I can put this together into a sort of simple paraphrase of this sentence. And it says some generic x stands in the a relation to all f's and g's. What does this actually mean? Well, I often encourage people to translate the logic first and then look at a symbolization scheme second. So once I actually look at the symbolization scheme, then I can just sort of replace using the words of English and the scheme into getting a real sentence. So I go from some generic H stands in the A relation to all F's and G's to some generic person is clawed by every scary cat. And we can see that it's very easy to translate if I focus on the main predicate in question. Symbolizing multi-place predicates really isn't that difficult than symbolizing single place. So there's more than enough information in this first short video lecture to get you started. In video two, we'll be looking at much more complicated expressions, but we'll see that uh, our basic skills still hold true.